Hello everybody and thank you for turning up today. So the crux of this lecture will be to look at the extent to which conservative foreign policy, specifically under Cameron but also under May, represents a break from traditional conservative thinking in terms of international affairs. And as I'm sure you'll all be very happy to know, we won't be talking about Europe. So we'll be looking at three areas um, outside of the UK's relationship with the European Union and that is the Conservative commitment to spend 0.7% of gross national income on foreign aid, um, intervention in Libya, Syria, or failed intervention in Syria and Iraq, and the role of the UK's special relationship with the uh, US, or supposed special relationship anyway. Um, but before we start with that, we'll take a look at the ideological framework within which Conservative foreign policy under Cameron operates. So since being elected as party leader, David Cameron sought a process of modernisation of the Conservative Party, mainly to counter images of the Conservative Party as the nasty party. Um, after two massive electoral failures in 1997 and 2001, Cameron was elected on the back of a promise to make the Conservative Party electable. This modernisation has been heavily studied um, in terms of its ideology, uh, its policy commitment, so for example, things like the environment, public sector reform, um, and the big society, one of Cameron's key pledges. But what hasn't really been looked at uh, in much detail anyway is the role of modernisation on foreign policy. So what we can do to begin with is look at what the Conservatives said in opposition right, um, about their foreign policy. And what we can see is this idea of liberal conservatism, which moves on from the kind of real polity um, or traditional conservative approaches to, to international relations. So in 2006, Cameron defined his foreign policy by saying, I'm a liberal conservative rather than a neoconservative. Liberal because I support the aim of spreading freedom and democracy and support humanitarian intervention. Conservative because I recognise the complexities of human nature and I'm sceptical of grand schemes to remake the world. So this was obviously in a post-9-11 and a post-Iraq environment, which we'll come to later. Um, this continued throughout opposition with Shadow Foreign Secretary at the time, William Hague, developing this idea in 2009, and he said, this is why David Cameron and I have spoken in recent years of our approach to foreign affairs being based on liberal conservatism, in that we believe in freedom, human rights, and democracy, and want to see more of these things in other nations. But conservative, because we believe strongly in the continued relevance of the nation state, and are skeptical of grand utopian schemes to remake the world. So this represents a consistent attempt at conservative rebranding of their own foreign policy commitments um, and, and worldviews. In 2011, in government, Haig also, as Foreign Secretary then, restated this view. So it's a consistent, concerted effort to, to set out a new course in a post-9-11 environment. And this represented one of the key challenges. Um, so the war on terror, kind of emanating from the US, and the rise of violent Islamic fundamentalism, um, and then the failures of Iraq meant the foreign intervention in the UK was, um, was publicly unpopular. Right? But if you marry this up with a desire to, to affect change in other nations, in failing states, say, or states that are engaging in a, in a policy that harms their own citizens, you need a way to, to create legitimacy with the public. And one of those ways is through a reframing of, of intervention. So Cameron shared New Labour's analysis of the threat from international terrorism, such as Al-Qaeda, and argued that in order to, to fight this threat, uh, he said, we need to stand up for our values and defeat what is a poisoned offshoot of a great religion. It can be done, but it's not going to happen through military action alone. We have to win every single battle in terms of soft power and hard power, of democracy as well as everything else. It's going to be a very, very long battle. However, this as, a, as an acceptance of the idea of the war on terror represents a break to begin with from traditional, European, uh, from traditional conservative thinking. So in interviews with former conservative foreign secretaries, um, an academic called Beach argued that actually their worldview of, of foreign secretaries who, who operate under Thatcher and Major was based on a more Burkean understanding of conservatism. So this idea that progress is possible but the move to a utopia of a peaceful world is impossible. And that what we will see, terrorism has always been around us and it will always be with us. It will just take different forms. So instead of the war on terror tackling something that is new and manifestly different, aka Islamic fundamentalism, this is just a restatement of a classic uh, threat from terror. And so the war on terror, whilst horrific um, as a term in this traditional conservative view, is meaningless, and 9-11 wasn't a game changer. 
rather just a very successful terrorist attack. Um, and so there's one element of a clash between Cameron's ideological positions and those who went before him, and we'll come back to that in more detail. Uh, in the build-up to the 2010 election, the Conservative Party website had a section called Where We Stand on Foreign Policy. And the website argued that foreign policy is above all about the protection and promotion of our national interests and will be crucial in charting Britain's path out of recession. So this was in 2010. It's in our national interest to promote free trade and sound development aid and work with other members of the UN Security Council to see that international law is respected and upheld. Above all, it is in our national interest to renew and reinforce our engagement with the rest of the world. So this merges historic conservative commitments towards foreign policy, namely the protection and promotion of national interests, uh, and simultaneously containing a more contemporary assertion associated with centre-left foreign policy. The commitment to sound developmental aid is the right thing to do on a moral level. Um, so it further restates the conservative position of engagement in its national relations rather than isolationism. And, and, and this conservative belief, or I believe held by the conservatives at least, that the UK's role is one of a responsible power within a community of states. Uh, however, what we can see, and, and we will see, is under Cameron, the conservatives' position in some areas shifted from engagement to intervention, a willingness to involve one nation in a, in a more active way, usually by utilising humanitarian or military instruments in conflict zones according to a set of principles or ideology. And in this case, that ideology was liberalism, right? Liberal democracy. Uh, most importantly, we see this in Lib Libya, Syria, and Iraq. And again, the website itself says we will base our foreign policy on liberal conservative principles, which you can hopefully see on the slide. For Beach, this, this mixture of conservatism and liberalism is a step change in conservative thinking. So it represents a movement away from foreign policy simply on British interests, to foreign policy around ethical issues and human rights alongside national interest. This does differ though from the New Labour, so under Tony Blair and Gordon Brown, uh, New Labour's approach to, towards the international community, which was a muscular form of international intervention where legal requirements, uh, international law was not necessarily a requirement for, it, for intervention. We see this in Iraq where where an intervention took place without a UN Security Council resolution. Cameron's conservatives are less willing to use this robust rhetoric, and they're more likely to employ a more cautious approach to utilising the military uh, for humanitarian ends. For Dado, this liberal conservative foreign policy is an attempt to come to terms with Britain's diminished position on the world stage, with the decline of things like empire. Um, so firstly, the legacy of the New Labour's years uh, it structured conservative foreign policy because, as I said, um, the reputational damage that the Iraq war did to the idea of humanitarian intervention or, or foreign adventures abroad was, was massive. And so this was a new public opinion um, framework within which the Conservative Party had to operate in. The reduced, uh, there was simply less money to go about in an age of austerity. And so there was an inability to pay for large-scale unilateral um, foreign intervention, or at least foreign intervention with just one or two partners. It was simply too expensive. And there was also an increasingly restricted capacity for Britain to exercise uh, what Dado terms ideational entrepreneurship in the uh, international community. So, for example, Britain's influence in the EU was diluted by the uh, increase in size to 20 member states. Um, Sidelined for example, to some extent by the French in NATO, the French and the Americans in NATO. And so this liberal conservatism leads to an argument with justification of, of limited, um, but, but real, but tangible um, access to things like human rights within the international sphere and the role of foreign governments to defend that right for peoples abroad. Um, but this must be done through international organisations such as the United Nations. And we'll see to what extent that this is a a clear break from Thatcherite um, foreign policy, a more neoconservative foreign policy perhaps, or traditional conservative pragmatism in international affairs. And we'll do that by starting with the case of foreign aid. So one of Cameron's key pledges in his modernisation process was the commitment to enshrine in law a, a legal commitment on the government to spend 0.7% of GNI, gross national income, on official development assistance. So instead of just saying the government will pledge to meet this, it enshrined it in the law. 
Um, and he called this uh, in a kind of nod to one nation conservatism and this ideology of Disraeli, uh, one world conservatism. And this was significant because traditionally the Conservative Party cut spending on international aid whenever it was in power. Um, it was also surprising to protect this by enshrining it in legislation, especially, the, especially since Britain underwent an austerity drive since the 2008 financial crisis. And so spending on education, on prisons, on law and order, um, on most areas except for health, um, foot fell. But spending on aid rose, and this created this, this uh, gruntlement on the back benches for Cameron. But it was enshrined in the International Development Official Development Assistance Target Act of 2015. Um, it made the United Kingdom the first member of the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD, to enshrine the law and target, um, and was again perhaps a result of New Labour's um, success in terms of making the UK a world leader in foreign assistance and foreign aid, and also because public opinion on the matter seemed to be in favour, at least on, on a broad level, of keeping foreign aid. It was seen as a, the right thing to do. And so there was a, certainly an ethical element to this. However, unlike with New Labour, um, the Conservatives sold this policy within this Liberal Conservative framework because they argued that essentially aid was one way uh, and increasing development in, in troubled countries was a way of preventing conflict and security threats that might af affect the UK further down the line. So we can see this um, in the justification for the policies from foreign aid ministers such as Andrew Mitchell and Justin Greening. So Mitchell promised that the government would not balance the books on the backs of the poorest people in the world. So a strong moral element there. Whilst Greening argued that tackling poverty overseas is about addressing the root causes of global challenges such as disease, migration, terrorism and climate change, all of which are the right things to do, so again, the moral element, and firmly in Britain's own national interest. We can see a kind of clearer picture of this in the 2010 Strategic Defence and Security Review, uh, which stated that aid was one of the mechanisms through which threats could be tackled at source by focusing on fragile and conflict-afflicted countries, where the risks are high, our interests are most at stake, and where we know we can have an impact. So this represents what we can term the opera uh, operationalisation of conflict prevention, and a shift from reacting to events and reacting to um, threats to the UK, to one of trying to prevent, to, to prevent it by spending money effectively and in a targeted manner in potential future trouble spots. So for Vickers, this represents a chart towards a more liberal conservative approach, distinct from the traditional real policy associated with conservative predecessors and distinct from neoconservative thinkers within the conservative government. Um, one of the papers I published uh, with colleagues in the University of Leeds and the University of Liverpool looked at those within the Conservative Party who voted against this, and we can measure the success of Cameron's modernisation against the size of the rebellion. And those that we term aid sceptics also traditionally were hard Euro sceptics and were also traditionally socially conservative. So 24 aid critics, 19 of them were hard Euro sceptics, 21 were socially conservative. And these formed a rump of opposition against Cameron that persisted throughout the 2015, uh, 10 to 15 Parliament. These were people who were opposed to Cameron on ideological grounds anyway, and who didn't like this idea that Cameron was too soft on the European Union. So defeated rivals for the party leadership, uh, for example, Liam Fox and David Davis, or, or dismissed ministers, so people with grudges. But opponents to aid tended to be old male social conservatives who, by and large, didn't feel like they had a, a place in Cameron's Conservative Party. However, there was only 24 people we term aid sceptics and the rest of the Conservative Party of around 320-ish or 310 at the time um, supported aid. And so we can see that this was a successful approach for Cameron um, to, to change, to restructure the Conservative Party along his more liberal conservative lines. And the kind of final uh, tick in the box for this policy can be seen in 2017 when Theresa May, who typically people suspected was an aid sceptic, committed to maintaining the 0.7% target, um, despite being more right-wing than Cameron on a range of other issues such as perhaps immigration and the EU. And it also was much more successful in his approach to try and convert the party to the cause of same-sex marriage, 
which although was passed through the Commons and is now legal in the UK, uh, a majority of Conservative MPs in the Commons rebelled against it. So foreign aid represents a particular area of success for Cameron's foreign policy, and it was done so by arguing that this is also a good national security policy, not just an ethical policy. So out of the Liberal and the Conservative elements, it was the Conservative side of this foreign policy that really won over Conservative MPs. Foreign intervention. So again, this whole area should be seen through the prism of post 9-11 and post-Iraq relations. The, th the first was in Libya. Uh, so in 2011, the UK took part in military intervention in Libya, uh, which was part of an international coalition aimed at securing a Libyan no-fly zone in accordance with the United Nations Security Council Resolution 1973, which stipulated that all necessary measures should be taken to protect civilians in Libya from attacks by the Libyan government. This was a case of a government that was attacking its own people um, and that many suspect was committing war crimes. The result was the effective establishment of a no-fly zone a victory for the NATO-led coalition and the eventual overthrow of the Gaddafi government. But unsurprisingly, post-conflict post reconstruction has been problematic. Um, but one of the strategies that Cameron used to, to get this passed by the Commons was to A, avoid being seen to be, to be dragged into another country in the Middle East um, for long periods of time, like Iraq, and instead focus on very narrow goals and essentially say, look, we will allow for the rebels, or we will allow um, for the alternative government to win, to defeat Gaddafi, but we won't stick around too long afterwards to help them rebuild their country. It will be up to them to do that. So to what extent does Libya support the case of a conservative government having a liberal conservative approach to IR? Dado and Schnapper argue that the intervention in Libya was part of a new concept uh, of bounded liberalism which is essentially this idea of liberal conservatism. It ties together elements of progressive faith in human nature and international institutions to, prog to progress um, and rein in the excesses of state behavior with a hard-headed realist appreciation of global politics and that international relations will always be, despite progress, will always be a forum for conflict and for struggle. And interestingly, Cameron's approach to Libya represents a rejection of a neoconservative approach endorsed by some such as Michael Gove, um, then the Education Secretary and now the Environment Secretary. So neoconservatives argue for a muscular liberal approach on the, on the international stage, arguing that democracy promotion in foreign countries is a good thing because liberal democracy is a good thing. And the role of countries that have liberal democracy is essentially to export democracy. Cameron was much more cautious, uh, so again, Iraq, uh, made many people more cautious, but Cameron especially, in that he argued that actually we shouldn't just go gung-ho into any country that doesn't have liberal democracy and promote it or into troubled countries. What we should do is look for violations of state sovereignty, so specific instances where states, where nations are attacking their own people, undermining the social contract that state sovereignty is meant to be built on, also one where there was a clear legal basis in international and regional support. So, early evidence from the coalition government's national security strategy suggested that a liberal conservative engagement approach, so engaging with, with countries as partners or, or rebels as partners rather than riding over domestic uh, actors, won out. The Libyan crisis forced Cameron to consider foreign affairs in a way he'd rather would have avoided. Okay, so he never really came to, uh, to, to, to be Prime Minister in order to have a muscular foreign affairs. In fact, Europe as a foreign policy area uh, brought down John Major, brought down um, Margaret Thatcher, as well as the poll tax, and he didn't want to be the next Conservative Prime Minister to have to resign because of foreign policy, especially not Europe, which obviously didn't work out well for him. Um, but it forced him to consider foreign affairs in a way he would have brought up for him. So, Post-Iraq Britain was sceptical about military intervention, and so rhetorically Cameron had to justify the actions through two different methods. A basic moral position, this is the right thing to do. Gaddafi was attacking his own people, and we know that's wrong. Also a justification through regional support and wider multilateralism in the context of NATO. Again, Euroscepticism meant the, for conservatives, NATO's the key 
organization for foreign policy rather than the EU. Yeah. Also part of one of the reasons why the why the UK has always been against, or at least the Conservatives, have always been against the idea of an EU army. Um, unlike say Macron. Davidson argues that Cameron's decision to intervene cannot be explained by traditional theories of IR, so constructivism, defensive realism or liberalism. Um, and instead, it was because Cameron bought into the norm of responsibility to protect. Right? This is the idea that obliges individual states to protect populations from genocide, from war crimes, ethnic cleansing, crimes against humanity, wherever they occur. Okay, so it's not so sovereignty is an absolute. Sovereignty is conditional on a state respecting some very, very basic rights of its own people. And Cameron bought into this as part of this liberal conservative idea, and so much the liberal side of this. So Cameron essentially, or unofficially, developed three tests for foreign intervention that will measure these three um, interventions against. One was demonstrable need, one was regional support, and the third was a clear legal basis. The tests are interesting because they're not really aligned to any understanding of the national interest. Right? The need of, a Lib of the Libyan people to be protected against their own government is not really in the UK's national interest. Um, ensuring regional support for intervention in Libya is not really in the UK's national interest. Okay? And a clear legal basis, well, it's the UN, right? Essentially, what are they going to do? It's not in, you can, you, can, you can act without UN Security Council resolutions and your country won't be threatened. So, the th sorry. Yes, so, in a joint lecture in 2011, Cameron, Obama and Sarkozy, the President of France, argued our duty and our mandate under UN Security Council Resolution 1793 is to protect civilians. It's not to remove Gaddafi by force, so they narrowed down the basis, uh, the, the role of this intervention, even though, obviously, by empowering rebels within Libya, it increased the likelihood that Gaddafi would be removed. We can also see the liberal conservative foreign policy approach shine through the case of Libya. Uh, the rival ideological grouping, neoconservatism, remained on the fringes, and Cameron instead looked to recent British foreign policy failures as his inspiration and showed that he was able to learn about the dangers of too expansive uh, a foreign policy. In terms of Syria, Syria is an interesting one. David Cameron recalled MPs to vote on UK participation in a US-led military strike against Syria. Uh, the government, however, was defeated and it represents the first time the UK House of Commons voted um, against the Prime Minister on a matter of war and peace since 1782. Right. So as a result, no military strikes were conducted by the UK and then Obama, who was always reluctant to intervene in Syria, then said, well, without the support of the UK, we won't intervene. And so Assad was left to fight another day. The vote was also within the context of the Syrian civil war um, after Assad used chemical weapons on his own people, right? So a clear violation of human rights. Uh, and if ever there was an area where responsibility to protect would be relevant, it would be Syria. And yet Cameron couldn't get this idea of intervention passed. Well, why? If we go back to his three tests, demonstrable need. Well, UN weapon inspectors were not able to identify chemical weapons within Syria uh, because they were unable to access the required sites. This inability to get UN backing um, for intervention in Syria due to Russia and China's veto on the Security Council meant that Labour under Ed Miliband, so the opposition party in the UK, said that they could not support intervention in Syria. And so the demonstrable need was not there. Regional support, not clearly forthcoming. So regional actors such as Iran criticised any military action, while Jordan announced it would not permit any strikes to be launched from its territory, and also Russia, heavily opposed. Um, a clear legal basis, there was no UN Security Council resolution either, so it was much harder to argue that the UK had a legal footing um, because it was opposed by both Russia and China. And so Cameron was unable to convince the Commons to support his action. Um, the media reported that originally the leader of the opposition, Ed Miliband, would have supported um, Cameron's attempt and, and military intervention would have been passed but a kind of last minute display of power politics changed his mind in a way to embarrass, um, in a way to embarrass Cameron. And while it might have done that, it also undermined Ed Miliband's future arguments to be a moral actor on the international stage. But 
Instead of seeing this as a failure of Cameron's ideological positioning or, or a retreat from liberal conservatism, it might actually just be poor party management and poor parliamentary management. So in total, 30 Conservative MPs rebelled and nine abstained on the vote. And we can see that the people who again rebelled, according to Tim Heppel, were those who again were the same people roughly who rejected the foreign aid legislation. So people who are long-term opponents of Cameron, who saw this as a chance to give the Prime Minister a bloody nose. However, so for example, some Eurosceptics voted against it, but some voted for it. And what was more important was that Conservative MPs who rebelled against the government argued that the case put towards the Commons was not a very good one. Uh, the debate was summed up by Deputy Prime Minister Nick Clegg, who everyone agreed had a very weak speech. Um, rebels and abstainers raised questions about the impact of strikes, arguing it wouldn't degrade Assad's chemical weapons stock anyway, so it wouldn't do what it was meant to do, because nobody knew where these weapons were. It wouldn't protect Syrian civilians, and it could escalate the conflict further and draw the UK in to a long and costly civil war uh, where the opposition, or where Assad, the UK's opposition, would have been backed by Russia. So the prism of Iraq is vitally important here. And the conservative realists, or the pragmatists, essentially reared, reared their heads and were able to defeat, um, or at least provide a counter-narrative to Cameron's liberal conservative narrative. Um, one Tory minister is quoted as saying, the vote was a catalogue of errors, bringing back Parliament in a rush, failing to get Ed Miliband on board because Cameron wouldn't wait for UN weapons inspectors to do their job, failing to eke out enough support for the government motion, despite having a working majority of 84. Uh, so one Tory minister described the whole thing as a shambles. So it's not fair probably to use Syria as an example of a rejection of this ideology by Conservative MPs, but rather a poor parliamentary um, strategy by Cameron and his whips. And this is supported when we consider that a year later Cameron secured a large parliamentary majority for UK military intervention in Iraq, which we'll talk about now. So the UK involvement in Iraq began in August when humanitarian aid, sorry, August 2014, when the Royal Air Force uh, made humanitarian aid airdrops in, in northern Iraq. Uh, following the release of a video purporting to show the beheading of a British citizen, David Haynes, by ISIL's Mohammed Mwazi, also known as Jihadi John, David Cameron recalled Parliament in September to authorise British airstrikes against ISIL. Cameron told MPs that the intervention, at the request of the Iraqi government, um, was to combat a brutal terrorist organisation and was morally justified. Right? And it's hard to argue against bombing terrorists. So he, had, he made this argument again and again on a moral ground, aware of what previous intervention in Iraq had, had resulted in for the UK. He went on to state that ISIL was a direct threat to the United Kingdom, so we see this in the rise of homegrown domestic terrorism, uh, funded or encouraged by groups such as ISIL. Um, and British inaction would lead to more killing in Iraq. The US, French and the Dutch had, were already involved in, in airstrikes in Iraq. Going back to Cameron's free tests that we saw in Libya, compared to the case of Syria, Iraq was more clear-cut, so there was demonstrable need. ISIS were controlling segments of Iraq. Um, they were the richest um, terrorist group in the world, control of oil fields, as well as carrying out genocide and supporting terrorist attacks. There was regional support to remove ISIL. Ter uh, Iraq had asked for assistance. Turkey, Jordan, Morocco and Iran were also involved in fighting this terrorist group. And there was a clear legal basis. Uh, Iraqi consent to use military force to defend itself. You don't need a UN Security Council resolution when a country invites you in to help defend itself. So Iraq is also a representation of liberal conservatism. Liberal because the government was supporting what Cameron called a generally inclusive government in Iraq, but conservative because it didn't pledge boots on the ground or involvement on the ground, but it did aim to defend the UK's national interest. Instead, the role of these airstrikes were to provide cover for Iraq and neighbours to remove ISIL themselves. So we can see the articulation of liberal conservatism across the three foreign policy areas. Um, but it seems that this, for Cameron, although it was an approach that he used, it was an ideological framework that he used for foreign intervention, it still needed to be backed up through things such as a strong legal argument to win over, to win over neoconservatives on the right, 
pragmatic traditional conservatives in the centre, and also the opposition. So it wasn't just enough to frame it around moral and national interest terms, you also needed a strong game plan, because not all conservatives shared his ideological view. Well, this is worrying. Well, oh, there we go, worth the wait. So the third case study is the special relationship between the UK and the US. Um, I really should have put special relationship in inverted commas because it might be special to the UK, but it's probably not to the US. And I imagine it's very much like when you have a crush on someone and they don't like you back. And so you sit there waiting for them to text and they don't. And um, Anyway, that wasn't from personal experience. So the final case we'll look at is the special relationship uh, between the UK and the US. One of the key issues for British foreign policy makers is how to secure the UK's national interest since the end of empire, uh, British empire. So the United Kingdom patently no longer possesses the economic or military means to impose its will on the rest of the world by force um, or subtler force of coercion. Right? So whilst the UK might have quite a large amount of soft power, so do other countries, and we, we have diminishing hard power. The answer, the traditional conservative answer, has been to develop strong multilateral alliances, through the, especially through the articulation of an Atlantic-looking foreign policy posture and a cautious, sceptical stance on the EU. And a key way to use this is, is to attempt to leverage this special relationship with the, U, the US as a prop to Britain's global ambitions, so use the UK as a gateway to the US. Right? in the same way the UK used to offer itself as a gateway to the EU. Um, Cameron summed up this view in 2006 by arguing, the fact is that Britain just cannot achieve the things we want to achieve in the world unless we work with the world's superpower. So when it comes to special relations with America, conservatives feel it, understand it and believe it. There's quite an emotional attachment there as well. He also argues that we're clear from the outset. Our relationship with the United States is central to our foreign policy and will be one of deep and enduring partnership. However, Hayden Cameron <clears throat> summed up the relationship between the US and, and conservative government as solid but not slavish, an implicit criticism of Blair, uh, uh, um, the Blair-Bush relationship around Iraq as well. Uh, the Conservative Liberal Coalition Agreement, which set out the framework within which the coalition would, would legislate, said that the United States partnership would be strong, close and frank. And this special relationship is part of a broader transatlantic alliance which is also of central importance and is epitomised by NATO. Support for the transatlantic alliance and the special relationship is underpinned by the idea of Atlanticism, a concept which, I, which emphasises the broadly similar culture and heritage of, kind of North Atlantic and Anglo-Saxon political culture. So democratic ethos, national interests that are shared between the UK and the US. And we see this um, as being essentially born during the Thatcher years. So Prime Ministers before Thatcher did not really understand this idea of a special relationship in the way that Thatcher and subsequent Conservative leaders did. Before Thatcher, it was essentially, of course, your, your, your most important relationship would be with the world's superpower, especially during the Cold War. But there wasn't a romantic attachment to the US for most Conservative leaders. Under Thatcher, however, uh, there was a Thatcherite instinct to look westwards as opposed to towards Europe. Because of a common, especially because of the close relationship between Thatcher and Reagan, a shared commitment to new right thinking and to free markets. And this has this, unlike other areas where Cameron has been a bit of a rejection of Thatcherism, um, the Cameron ideology has subscribed to this Thatcherite idea of UK-US relations. So he talks a lot about the Atlantic alliance between the UK um, and Western Europe and the US forged during the Second World War in the fight against Nazism. Um, and then the defeat of fascism and the same partnership that stood up against the Soviet Union. So a shared history of standing up to, to, to the bad guys in this region. I don't know why they did that for bad guys. Um, they, they were. However, this is not a view shared by all conservatives. Uh, Lord Carrington, um, who was Thatcher's first foreign secretary, said, the special relationship is rather demeaning. The Americans couldn't care less about the special relationship. We bang on about it all the time. I think in the end, national interests are more important than special relationships. Certainly when I was at NATO, the US was much more interested in what was happening in Germany than what was happening with us, because the Germans were absolutely vital on the ground. Uh, this is shared by Thatcher's third and longest serving foreign secretary, Lord Howe, 
who said that the idea of the special relationship was misleading. He said, I spent most of my life trying to destroy the reputation of the phrase special relationship because it's profoundly misleading. It's a unique relationship. It's defined as important by both sides in the eyes of the United States, but in the United, eyes of the United States, it's no more or less significant than the relationship with Germany. Um, and we've seen it let us down many times. Granada, an obvious example. The support of Irish terrorist finances is another example. We've got a unique relationship with the United States. It's important to maximize the effectiveness of that, but not deceive ourselves by believing it's a special relationship. Lord Hurd said something similar. He said there was a good relationship, but it's not an equal relationship, and it's overhyped. It's important, but it's a mistake, he says, to think of it as unique. Other countries have relationships which they treasure with the United States, and it's not something the Americans naturally talk about. It's something we talk about because it's important to us. So, this divergence between Thatcher's view of the special relationship and her foreign secretary's view shouldn't be surprising because her foreign secretaries were much less ideological than she was. They were more conservative pragmatists. And one of the reasons why they were in the Foreign Office, right, because the Foreign Office is traditionally an area where you don't have ideology run wild. What you want is hard-headed pragmatism. Um, under John Major, Thatcher's successor, um, Sir Malcolm Rifkin, his second Foreign Secretary, said, if you had to have a pecking order, I think the vast majority of Conservatives would put the United States first, but not because of a love of Americans as such, but simply because of a recognition of the realities of power. That at the end of the day, the Commonwealth doesn't have the power in the way that the United States has. The European Union has economic power, but partly through its own choices, does not have military power or real political clout of a fundamental uh, kind. Well, this was written in 2010, I think, so that you might think that has changed. The United Nations only has as much power as its member states are prepared to give it. The United States doesn't need the United Kingdom in terms of our contribution in purely material terms. But it's enormously valuable to the United States, even under George W. Bush as to not appear to be acting completely unilaterally. So essentially, what he's saying is, it's good for the US if it can point to the UK and go, well look, the UK is doing it as well, so it can't be a bad decision. And so, the primacy of the special relationship from the position of Cameron is distinctly Thatcherite, rather than a kind of new liberal conservative approach. And it certainly wasn't the perspectives of previous conservative leaders, such as Anthony Eden, Harold Macmillan, Alice Douglas Hume, Edward Heath. The Thatcherite and, and, and subsequently Cameronite then position on the relationship with the US is almost a direct result of Euroscepticism. So you can't talk about foreign policy of the UK without it all coming back to Europe. Because of how Thatcherites understand Britain's place in the world, their lack of affinity for the EU and grand EU schemes almost forces them into the sphere of the US and of NATO. If you're going to reject a European um, extensive common security or military policy, where else are you going to go for multilateral action, NATO? And so this fuels Atlanticism. Um, and also, coupled with historical legacies, a love for the Commonwealth as well. So has this changed under May and Donald Trump? Well, not really, no. So May was the first foreign leader to meet Trump after he took office. Uh, she was strongly criticised by members of all major parties in the UK, including her own, for refusing to condemn Donald Trump's Executive Order 13769, which also known as the Muslim ban, um, and also as well as inviting Trump to a state visit with Queen Elizabeth. However, this is May playing real politics, right? If we're leaving the EU, this makes the UK-US relationship even more significant. And Trump, who is no fan of the EU, as well as backed a comprehensive post-Brexit trade deal, unlike Obama, who said the UK will go to the back of the queue in any trade negotiations during the referendum campaign. Uh, in kind of true Trumpian language, he's claimed that a US-UK trade deal will absolutely be possible, and that the US-UK US relationship is the highest level of special. Um, so May's been criticised for this, but it's an element of doing what is necessary on an international level, she would argue. Um, however, staying too close to Trump is a bit of a poison chalice. So she's trying to present herself as a, as a bridge to, to the US for the EU. Going, Look, we know Trump doesn't really like the EU. I mean, he doesn't like many European leaders. So you can use Britain. Britain is still valuable to you as a way of, of talking Trump down from some particularly worrying positions. So in this way, she's kind of used New Labour's approach of triangulation um, as a bridge between America and Europe. 
So, for example, when Europe was worried about Trump's anti-NATO comments and a lack of commitment to a rules-based order, May was able to extract some qualified support for the alliance during her visit there. And for David Goodhart, um, who you might know as someone who looks at societies and goes, the key divide in society now is between anywheres and somewheres, people who feel attached to an area and people who, who feel comfortable um, in, in a globalised world. Well, he says it's interesting to consider how things might have played out if Trump had won, but Brexit lost, and if we had remained in the EU. But David Cameron, remaining Prime Minister, um, the UK would have probably tacked closer to Europe in response to Trump, and this might have angered Trump to such an extent that there was no way of, of any European voice stopping him from ripping up parts of the rules-based order or weakening NATO, for example, say. So May's manoeuvring has helped prevent tensions from boiling over, he argues, and kept the UK's options open. And it might just be that the UK needs NATO, but also this, this could save, Goodhart would argue, the Western rules-based order. Okay, so to kind of sum up, this lecture, I guess, has argued there is such a thing as liberal conservatism and it has shaped conservative foreign policy under Cameron. Um, there's less evidence to allow us to describe May as a liberal conservative. Brexit has consumed so much of her time. Um, but the commitment to the foreign aid spending um, shows perhaps that in some areas Cameron's, social, uh, Cameron's liberal conservatism has won the day. Apart from the UK-US special relationship where the Thatcherite approach and the shared myths around that approach I still have a strong hold and will probably become stronger as the UK is forced to separate itself from Europe to a much greater extent. So in the future, uh, an increasing challenge for post-Brexit Conservative Prime Ministers, who will probably not be Theresa May, uh, will be to act as a bridge between the US and Europe, who have increasingly frosty relationships, and to reinstate or to restate the importance of the US-backed rules-based order. And just as Cameron came to the leadership of the Conservative Party in the context of 9-11 and Iraq um, and a whole new foreign policy environment, the next Tory Prime Minister will probably come to a new post-Brexit foreign policy environment where the rules-based order is under threat and the UK is searching for, for new allies and new ways of working. And in a world where this order is, is increasingly threatened by populist actors like Trump, like Orban in Hungary, for example. So whether liberal conservatism is an appropriate ideological tool to address these problems is a kind of question that conservatives will have to grapple with, uh, struggle with for a long time. And the battle for the soul of the conservatives' foreign policy approach is it's far from over. Thank you. volunteered to ask a question. How tolerated are splits in Germany within the Conservative Party when it comes to like members of Parliament rebellion against, for example, intervention in, in Syria? So a lot of it depends on the policy areas. Um, the 2010 to 2015 Parliament was the most rebellious in history. Um, and it tends to be over issues of Europe, right? Nobody's really surprised by that. Other areas, they tend to be um, social policy areas. So aid, say, is an important one for the Conservatives anyway. Um, and same-sex marriage. So these ones of conscience, people argue. And the drivers tend to be people, uh, conservative MPs who are not, um, who haven't fully bought into Cameron's modernisation pro project. And it's important because the 2010 intake of conservative MPs, uh, where Cameron won, I think he won about 60 odd seats. So it's a lot of new MPs, and then also in 2015, were much more Eurosceptic, but also more Cameronite in their outlook. So you get people who might be more socially liberal, but are also much more opposed to Europe. And they were not afraid of rebelling in this parliament, in the 2015 parliament. Um, and so they forced, they forced, um, essentially forced Cameron to pledge his in-out referendum. Um, and then, the ref after that, um, under Theresa May, there was a, an element of 
let's see what can let's see what is going to happen with Brexit. And then actually, although what you read in the papers suggests there's a lot of disquiet around Brexit, in the one key piece of Brexit legislation so far, um, the European Union Withdrawal Bill, when it came to the final vote, only one Conservative MP voted against it, and that's Ken Clark, um, who some of you might have heard of, but who's been a staunchly pro-European Conservative MP throughout his whole career. So, so far, actual rebellions over Brexit from the Conservative Party have been quite limited in legislative terms. Um, it's just been small skirmishes on issues that are less important. Um, the real worry for the Conservative Party at the moment is what the DUP will do. Now, for those that don't know, um, whilst Northern Ireland is still a part of the UK, uh, perhaps despite the Commission's best efforts, we have, it has a small party um, in, well, Northern Ireland has a completely different party system to the UK, or to, to the rest of Great Britain, rather. And one of the small parties there is called the Democratic Unionist Party, which is essentially quite right-wing um, in terms of social issues, heavily Eurosceptic, um, or Euro-rejectionist, actually, and very pro this idea of British unity. They feel, they represent people in Northern Ireland who feel very British, rather than Irish. Um, although they tend to be to the left on things like welfare and things like that, but that's different. Um, Theresa May losing her majority in 2017 meant that she had to rely on the DUP for support in Parliament. And so in, in a very recent agriculture bill, the DUP voted against it and, and defeated the government. Um, just flexing, flexing their muscles because they don't like Theresa May's checkers plan and they worry that there will be a, a system of border checks along the Irish Sea which would separate Northern Ireland from the rest of the United Kingdom, which is their red line in any Brexit negotiation. So the, the real worry at the moment is the DUP for, for Theresa May. Partly because rebellions have been so limited, partly because no one group in the Tories has a view on what Brexit should look like. There's lots of different tribes of Brexit, so there's no consensus. Um, but also because of the leader of the opposition, Jeremy Corbyn, um, who many Conservative MPs look at and think, do you know what? Any Brexit deal is better for the UK than a Jeremy Corbyn-led UK. Jeremy Corbyn as Prime Minister is going to be much worse than any form of Brexit. It's the logic that runs through Conservative MPs' heads, most of them anyway. So when push comes to shove, they're not necessarily going to bring down the government on this. Um, and to expand that further, actually, um, one, of the, one of the policies the Coalition brought in was the Fixed Term Parliament Act. And what that means is the traditional votes of no confidence. So, for example, losing a, a vote on your budget does not mean the government falls. There has to be a very specific um, motion passed by Parliament. So you can vote down anything, really, a government puts forward, but it won't have to resign over an issue of confidence because you need to follow this very specific mechanism. Um, so rebellions aren't as important as they used to be either. So you can rebel more because it's safer to. You, you know, if you, if you worry that your rebellion is going to bring down the government and so force a general election, you're, you're less likely to do it. But if you think that actually it might not bring down the government and you can express your discontent because of the Fixed Term Parliament Act, um, you're much more likely to, to rebel. Yeah. Um, a few months ago, uh, you recognized the push that uh, we gave a few points on how the Union should be with the UK when it comes to Britain. And uh, one, of the point, one of the points he put is um, about uh, explicit talks with the for increasing the intervention on the West Indian. When it comes to the Middle East, because I'm aware that there are conclusions that Someone that when it comes to contacts and spies and all that, UK has the has the upper hand in, in, in that uh, in that region. The, the European countries they have no advantage over it. Given the fact that for the West, the, the Middle East is a very important uh, theater when it comes to um, diplomatic. How will Brexit affect the relationship of Western foreign policy, especially for Europeans, with regards to the Middle East? Well, I suppose it depends on the future of. 
of which organisations should foreign policy vis-à-vis -vis the Middle East be played out. So if you think that it should be um, through NATO, then perhaps there'll be a limited impact of Brexit. What is probably most likely to happen is one area of the agreement that will, between the UK and the EU, will be on, right, on, on things like security, on things like um, foreign intervention. But up to now, the EU has been limited in its in its approach to foreign intervention. It, for example, Germany, um, as a kind of unofficial de facto leader of the EU, has been quite um, quite uncomfortable with the idea of foreign military intervention. Uh, only recently has this this unease lifted somewhat. Um, and so a lot of this depends on actors. And to a for a rules-based order, a worrying amount depends on the personal relationships between leaders. So if, for example, you, you have a future British Prime Minister, French President and German Chancellor who all get on and all share a common view of what this security, um, what an, an EU-UK security relationship should look like, well, it would be very easy to get there. But if you have personal animosities between them, um, then you might not. Also, events are vitally important. So things like the, the migrant crisis has pushed you know, EU, Northern African relations to almost the top of the board. Um, but if there's no external driver, well, the EU or the Euro at least has enough problems to be getting on with about trying to force a new conceptualization of how security policy should operate. So in the short term, at least, um, spy networks, spy network sounds very James Bond, but things like Five Eyes, so the cooperation between the, you know, I think it's, the US, uh, South Africa, uh, the UK, countries such as France will continue because a lot of Franco-UK relations and security operations operate through NATO anyway. And for, for Cameron in his three tests, what was important was not necessarily whether the EU was on board, in fact that wasn't important. What was important was having NATO on board, NATO allies working together, and that's what was increasingly important for the US as well under Obama. Whether that will be as important under Trump, whether Trump will be particularly concerned if NATO backs his engagements or not, remains to be seen. But in, in running quite an isolationist foreign policy to some extent, um, in terms of foreign intervention, we might not get to test that if Trump only lasts another two years. Yeah, so I, so post Brexit, obviously, the UK will need to find a role for itself. So post empire and post Brexit, it's it, there's a few kind of competing visions, right? One of which is articulated by kind of more populist actors, where your your typical like you know we should look at countries that are exploiting the UK economically, we should reduce immigration, um, we should tackle big global financial companies that are exploiting the UK workforce and basically pull up the drawbridge. Right, we've got enough problems at home to be worrying about what's going on overseas. A second one is more of the type of leader, argued for by like Michael Gove and Boris Johnson, uh, which is the UK should become more of a, a Singapore of the West, right? So we should get rid of uh, you know, all the EU red tape, we should get rid of domestic red tape, and we should, um, we should, have, we should be a low regulation, nimble economy. Um, so these are two very competing visions of what Brexit should look like. Now, in one of them, at least in the in, in the in the free trade vision, the UK would be a, a stepping stone for countries in Europe to deal with the US, both in terms of um, if, say, the UK gets a much deeper free trade deal with the US than it can currently get with, within part of the EU, uh, because obviously when you're negotiating for 28 countries. There's a lot more red lines than when you're negotiating for just one. But European firms could set up bases in the UK to then export to the US. Now, skeptics of that approach might say, well, many, many firms, many European firms already did just that 
So they set up in the UK so they can have a kind of a near workforce who understand the language, you know, understand the American culture, blah, 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 and export it. Like that. In the same way that other countries use the UK as a bridge to Europe, um, they would set up in the UK because of the legal system, um, fairly favourable to firms, quite stable, fairly low taxes, fairly free economy, um, and some places quite nice to live in. And so this idea of a, of a bridge might be optimistic thinking, right? Because there will be lots of places where that will, will show itself to be a bridge. Why not Canada as part of NAFTA? Um, why not, you know, I'm struggling to think of a second place. Why not just move to America yourself? But that is one view of Britain trying to find out a new role for itself. Another one being um, to have a much closer relationship with kind of the old Commonwealth countries, such as New Zealand, um, Australia, South Africa, and the UK. Um, no, um, no, not really. I don't think so because the thing about the EU is that you had a, a group of countries that were, although they had the differences, they were fairly similar. In, in, in many respects, um, and the and there was a a, a certain set of historical um, actions that meant that there was a, a desire for deep integration under a non-national organisation. Right, that's not there for the Commonwealth um, for two reasons. One, countries that are completely different. Um, the, Basically, you know, all they have in common in many respects is an inherited British legal system, um, and and most speak English, right? And, and some of them might have the Queen as the head of state, but not all. Um, but apart from that, you know, things like commitment to human rights. No, I mean, so people might say that you know Hungary and Poland are taking turns to the hard right, but that's nothing to what happens in some Commonwealth countries. Um, there might be deeper. There might be deeper um, relations with the kind of more advanced, what we term Western Commonwealth countries: America, New Zealand, Australia, New Zealand, um, South Africa, perhaps. And well, Ireland will be in the bottom. Ireland part of the EU. That's that's ruled out. But I think the future of of integration, at least, is regional. You can see this happening across Africa at the moment. So the African Union, um, although obviously nowhere near as, the momentum is nowhere near as strong as it is in Europe. The African Union as a body is, is gaining in, 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 in strength, I guess, or at least capacity. Um, and within Africa, regional trade bodies are deepening their, uh, deepening their integration. Uh, so common currencies will be more common. Um, the African Union has a project to introduce a, a currency in the long run, um, called the Afro, funnily enough. And Places like, say, Kenya, Uganda, big, big hitters are engaged in regional integration. So I don't think the future is, for the UK, is, um, is integration with the Commonwealth. Partly because also, at the moment, the, the GDP of these countries, even if you could get all of them into a trade deal, would probably still be dwarfed by the be dwarfed by the, the EU. And the future then probably is for the UK to leverage relationship, which Cameron talked about actually, or Cameron talked about, and, and, and may also talk about with India, for example, which has a shared history and, a, and a, you know, a population of billion, over a billion, nearly, and almost a shared history there. So perhaps playing with, uh, playing with relationships with some former Commonwealth country, or with, with some former colonies, um, rather, but not necessarily on the level of... But imagine being the country that tapped into China 15, 20 years ago, had a very close relationship and was the first person in Europe to be on the phone to China. You would be rolling in it right now. So to kind of find the next big winner, big hitter like that, would be very uh, lucrative for the Conservatives, or for the, for the UK. Any more questions? Would you say there are uh, 
I guess it depends. Um, things like it depends on, I guess, from a student perspective, if things like Erasmus um, aren't sorted out before we leave, it, that would mean that, first of all, you know, UK students coming to, to Malta and Maltese students going to the UK um, might face barriers. But at the same time, I don't see why you can have an Erasmus that, you know, Turkey and Switzerland are in, but not the UK with universities like Oxford and Cambridge and Liverpool. Let's get that one in there. Um, <laughs> um, otherwise I'll, I'll go home and find out my desk has been cleared. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't really see. So you might, you might try and see uh, the UK trying to play up shared ties, countries to try and keep people on side. But at the moment, the EU seems to be acting in a very um, unified manner towards the UK, which again in the referendum we were told wouldn't happen because Germans want to sell us cars and the French don't and so that will cause a split and then we'll kind of divide and divide and rule as the Brits are wont to do. Um, but now it's not happened so I doubt it. Is that, is that it? Is that... Um, what I think the kind of, I think you're right, yeah, so so NATO will still be the most important lens for, for a long time, but I think what will change, and I feel kind of safe saying this because we'll never know if I was wrong or not, is that by leaving the EU, there has been, the EU has lost a voice that is quite sceptical about expanding European Union power in foreign policy areas, things like a European army, um, things like deeper defence uh, cooperation. And so what might happen, or what the difference that we might see now is that the EU's been set on a course for much deeper integration in terms of, of foreign policy and foreign intervention, that the UK might have started. And then, so you might have a situation where NATO and the EU become rival centres for, for intervention. And, and that might have been something that could have been avoided had the, had the UK remained. But obviously it's a, you know alternative history now, so we never know. Um, but I suspect that when it comes to foreign, foreign policy, foreign intervention at least, pragmatism will rule. And if it's the EU, you know, intervening in the country for humanitarian reasons, the UK will sign up as a partner because that's, that's the pragmatic thing to do. And when lives are at stake in such a clear way, ideology, that's why traditionally the foreign office has been seen as the pragmatic part of government. Um, but for NATO, I think for now will will be the kind of key element of, especially with the the rise of Russian um, aggression or intervention, new kind of non traditional um, foreign policy approaches. It will be NATO will have a a more important role, kind of almost fulfilling its traditional its original function. And how do you see the relationship with NATO or the role of NATO, especially with yeah, I think sometimes you need. So the thing about Europe is it's all very um, polite to you know you're all very polite to each other, and then it's you know sharp messages or you know. Um, briefings and things like that, whereas Trump is just saying, look, if you want, if you want your defence, you've got to pay for it. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing, because if, if you've got countries that are not paying their, their agreed share in terms of defence funding to NATO, it's a lot easier for Donald Trump to say, look, we're bankrolling the security of Eastern Europe here, and why should we, you know, to folks back home? But if everybody is paying their fair share as percent of GDP, it's much harder to say, look, they're free riding on what we're doing. So 
it's probably in country's interest to pay up and stop grumbling about it because they'd be the first to complain when Russian time, you know, things like that. Um, but it's also going to have to be a shift, I think, and this is where Donald Trump might be a bit of a roadblock towards, or it's a continued movement towards tackling new forms of, um, of attack, cyber warfare, for example, and Donald Trump's hesitancy to accept um, that Russia is engaged in these methods, and also things like the Salisbury poisoning in the UK. Russia's willing to resort to Cold War tactics again, and, and, uh, and the fact that Donald Trump didn't immediately condemn Russia, and in fact the leader of the opposition, Jeremy Corbyn, didn't um, either, and only begrudgingly condemned Russia when it became clear that they did it, um, as everyone knew they did, that might be a challenge. But in terms of old school intervention, um, Donald Trump's really not as much of a challenge to, to that. That will still happen. The world will still have bad people doing bad things. Uh, the UK was always like this, um, uh, this chapter of sovereignty, it was the parliament of sovereignty, all that. But after, um, uh, when, when we get into the real Brexit scenario, how will uh, Britain as a state on its own look towards the, um, the creation of the European Union? Will it be more positive because at the end of the day it will be more I think a lot of that depends on, well, first of all, I think public attitudes towards, um, and MPs' attitudes towards the idea of a European army will go from, you know, almost, well, we don't really see the need for an EU army to, to indifference, essentially. If, if the Europeans want a European army, well, that's their decision, at least we're not paying for it, right? Um, on a kind of elite level, the real, the kind of proof will be in the pudding. So will the EU army, will it be an effective body or, I mean, there's still voices within the EU who argue against the EU army. And so will it actually, in a kind of spirit of European compromise, have um, its effectiveness clipped? And might it just be almost like, an, like a humanitarian disaster relief agency of the EU, rather than um, allowing the EU to follow a more muscular foreign intervention policy? So a lot of it depends on, on the capacity of the army itself, so how many troops individual nation states are willing to give or member states are willing to give. Um, but it also depends on what that army is allowed and not allowed to do and what are the mechanisms. Because if it has to be approved by 28 member states, deploying that army suddenly becomes a lot more cumbersome than if you have a European high commander, say, um, or if the European president can, or the President of the Commission can say, look, we're going to do this. So a lot of it depends on the capacity um, and, and, the, and the legal framework within which that army operates upon whether it would be an effective challenge to NATO or not. Um, but in terms of UK's position towards it, I imagine it would be one of, if it's, a, if it's a good partner, yes, but it might just be, well, you can't really count on the EU army. You, st you know, NATO is still a way to go. The real question then becomes, what happens to France? Does France's um, allegiance change? Does it shift towards this EU army at the expense of NATO? And that could be a real game changer if, if, the, if the UK loses its key European partner from NATO, suddenly the capacity of NATO uh, might, be, might be weaker without a consummate increase in strength from the European side. So I think that the Thank you.